the ordinary candle, invented in the ancient world, became a crucial factor in the development of humanity. Throughout all times, humans have thought about how to light their homes after sunset. Fire was the primary method of obtaining light. Millennia will pass, mighty empires will be leveled to the ground, and new ones will rise in their place. Humanity will plunge into the darkness of the Middle Ages. And finally, a new era will dawn, an era when humans learn to make mechanisms using physical phenomena. With the invention of the steam engine, the general mechanization of manual labor will begin, and dynamo machines and chemical power sources will be invented. Only then, will humans be able to create fundamentally new types of lighting devices. Incandescent lamps, gas discharge lamps, and others will become widespread. The exponential development of technology will lead to the rapid adoption of other light sources, fundamentally new, light-emitting diodes that are much brighter and more efficient. By the first half of the 21st century, LEDs will have practically displaced all their competitors, unless by that time humans invent something better. LEDs find widespread use wherever light is needed, from city lighting to handheld flashlights. It is about the latter that my story today is focused. But let's go back in time, to the challenging era when the world had just emerged from one world war and immediately plunged into another, the Cold War. Despite this, many will remember those times as the best. Not because they were so good. It's just that their childhood fell on those challenging years, and childhood, as we know, is the most vivid, colorful period in our lives, a time of discovering everything around us. In the Soviet Union, they made many different kinds of flashlights, but perhaps one of the most interesting variants are these so-called bugs. Flashlights of this type are still made today, but this LED mass production doesn't interest us, so let's look at the Soviet models. Their feature is that they contain a dynamo generator machine, meaning they don't require any batteries or charging from the grid to operate, such as all you need to get light is to press the lever. It emits a characteristic sound during operation. Hence the name, Zuchek Bug. This beauty, which in form factor undoubtedly resembles a regular bar of soap, is actually quite a rare item. The electrodynamic flashlight SP3, produced by the Leningrad factory Electrosola in November of 53, and the year was difficult for the Soviet people, as just a few months earlier, Joseph Vissarionovich had passed away. Overall, this line starts with the SP-1 model. According to information from the Internet, it was developed in the mid-30s of the last century for the Soviet drifting polar station North Pole 1. The letters SP and the flashlight's name actually stand for North Pole. They would have been useful to the polar explorers, as they are not afraid of the cold, since there are no batteries and the flashlights are always ready to work. But to be honest, this flashlight is not entirely a Soviet development, as they say. They borrowed it. In the mid-30s, the French already had pygmy flashlights that look a bit like ours, don't they? It's quite hefty compared to modern ones. The body, presumably made of Bakelite, has a latch or lock for the lever. When in operation, it makes a wonderful sound. You can hear not only the buzzing, but also the ratchet working. The bulb, of course, is definitely our most favorite warm and soulful. There is something like a reflector. And the front lens. I don't have the original box with instructions, but judging by photos from the internet, it should have a bulb inside rated at 2.5 or 3 volts with a current of 160 milliamps. How does it illuminate? Well, in complete darkness, you can manage to light your way somehow. And that's better than nothing. The lever is quite stiff. I don't know how convenient it is to use such a flashlight in northern conditions, but I don't envy the polar explorers for whom it was created. Although, perhaps the idea was also to warm up the fingers through exercise. Another drawback of the lever is that it can easily pinch your fingers. Judging by the factory seals, yes, those are indeed seals. It hasn't been opened in 64 years. 
Honestly, I didn't want to take it apart, but the channel's theme demands it. All for the viewer. As one viewer once said, we're letting the air out of the USSR, and it's nice. Inside, we can notice a large gear made of textilite and a rack, with a return spring. If you look closely at the details on that same large gear, you can see the ratchet mechanism. Everything here is made of brass, small springs, hand-finished components. Well, it's beautiful, you have to agree. And most importantly, how much soul has been put into this? It's pleasing to see the abundant amount of grease, which naturally increases the lifespan of the mechanism, but makes the operation a bit stiff. The alternator itself consists of a permanent magnet as the rotor, and a winding as the stator. There are two windings wound with copper wire on a magnetic core made of electrical steel plates. The assembly style and attention to detail are at a very commendable level. The flashlight, of course, is worn by time, but a lot of effort was put into its creation, aiming to make it as reliable as possible. This is worthy of respect. Well, we won't bother this old timer any longer. Another electrodynamic flashlight from the USSR, with the enemy name Fred. In fact, it's an acronym meaning handheld. Electrodynamic flashlight. It was released in a later period, and the cheapness is already noticeable. But despite this, it has the smoothest operation. You can press it with minimal effort, unlike the previous version. The light is slightly brighter. It fits perfectly in the hand, and everything is great, except that it can pinch your fingers because the lever has sharp edges. A clear oversight on the part of the designers. It has a metal reflector. The incandescent bulb is adjustable for focus. But in my case, the reflector moves along with the lamp, but this is easy to fix. The handle is metal with a plastic lock. The front glass is actually glass. The operating principle is no different from the first one, but the mechanism here, in my opinion, is more advanced and cutting edge solutions are applied for such flashlights. We have a large gear made of plastic. It transmits the torque to the generator shaft. On the generator itself, there is another gear with a ratchet mechanism, also made of plastic. It is worth noting that the large gear rotates in a brass bushing. The presence of brass posts was also pleasing. After all, not everything here is made of plastic, like in modern devices. The generator is more or less the same as in the first case. The magnet here is not quite ordinary. Despite its age, it's still quite strong. It might be samarium cobalt or a YNK alloy. The stator has two windings made of copper wire. There is no additional electronics here. The current generated by the generator is directly supplied to the incandescent lamp, just like in the first version. To make this video at least a little informative, I decided to assemble the flashlight and conduct some demonstration measurements. Let's check the generator's characteristics. For instruments, we have a tachometer to measure the revolutions in this wonderful RSHS-806 device, a portable oscilloscope multimeter, and data logger all-in-one from our sponsor, the company RS Pro. The device can display the obtained values as a graph and monitor any parameter over time, whether it's voltage, current, resistance, or something else. We can also save all the obtained values as, for example, a regular text document, transfer it to a flash drive, and then view it on a computer. Select the multimeter mode, then alternating voltage and data recording. I will try to apply pressure at a steady speed to maintain the RPM. The open circuit voltage generated at an average of 3 to 3,500 rotor RPM is about 3.5 volts. That's if you press the lever at a frequency of 3 to 4 hertz, meaning calmly, without getting tired. The generator can output 8 volts, but not for long. The hand gets tired. Next, we save the obtained data. On the computer, you can study all this as a text file. Here, the measurement time, voltage, and everything else are displayed. We see that on average, the voltage was around 3.5 volts. Next, in exactly the same way, I want to check the generator's current in short circuit mode. The measurement conditions are the same. The maximum current in short circuit mode averaged 350 to 400 milliamps. 
and the peak current I managed to get was just under half an amp. And, lastly, I took a variable resistor and by adjusting the resistance, I achieved a maximum output power of about 0.6 watts. That's if you press the lever at a frequency of 3 to 4 hertz. This measurement should ideally be done purely with an oscilloscope, considering that mine is dual channel. But in this case, it would take too long to explain everything, so let's leave it at that. And this chalk is from the same period as the first version. Manufactured at the Krasnodar plant ZIP. In terms of characteristics, it's about the same, just with a different casing. It was released during the Khrushchev thaw, when the world was a bit relaxed, but very soon the superpowers would start competing, the Cuban Missile Crisis would occur, and everyone would be holding their breath, waiting for nuclear war. Where was I? Oh, right. So, the flashlight was released in 58. This flashlight, unfortunately, is a bit broken, but you can still manage to make it work somehow. Its construction is more complex, and when disassembling it, you should be careful because there are small parts that can easily be lost. I believe the flashlight's mechanism is unnecessarily complicated, but the engineers know best. On the plus side, I'll note the convenient lever that doesn't pinch your fingers, unlike the previous two versions. It is also metal, but has rounded edges. Respect, for that. They, finally figured it out. The large gear is made of Gedenax, and the magnet on the rotor is round and similar to the previous ones. Despite all the shortcomings of such a mechanism, the designer's approach is serious. You can notice balancing marks on the rotor. Metal posts are visible everywhere, which is not surprising. Back then, equipment was made to be reliable, the market economy wasn't developed, and no one was trying to make equipment break down after a year, forcing the user to buy a new one. The flashlight fits comfortably in the hand, is quite compact but hefty, and is also equipped with a lever lock. The body, just like in the first version, is made of Bakelite, and it has a lens and a reflector for the bulb. Now many will say, convert at least one of the versions to LED and use it. But, why? Why ruin the original internals and appearance? Of course, if you really want to, you can add a rectifier with shocky diodes after the generator, fit a compact supercapacitor, replace the bulb with LEDs, and you'll get a quite decent flashlight, with a storage unit. And you won't need to constantly press the lever intensively to get light. Yes, all of this can be done, but if I needed a dynamo flashlight for everyday use, I would buy a ready-made Chinese one. And I even have some of those. But these beauties will stay in my collection as a reminder of those times. No one will produce such things anymore, and in my opinion, ruining them is not the best activity. This video is coming to an end. Don't forget to leave your feedback and share the video with your friends. Well, that's about it. And as always, this was Kazyanov Ka with you. See you next time. Bye.